Woo! Yeah. Okay. <coughs> so, thank you for coming. This is a wonderful turnout. Um, my name is Yasi Eskandari. I'm a member of the Berkeley Student Food Collective. Um, the Berkeley Student Food Collective is an incredible group of students who are dedicated to providing fresh, local, sustainable foods to the Berkeley campus and community. Um, in case you haven't heard the good news, we're officially open for business. Woo! 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 Um, we're right across the street at 2440 Bancroft Way. Please check us out if you haven't already. And everything that you're enjoying today is actually from the food collective. Uh, you're welcome. <laughs> uh, before I forget, I'd like to thank Project Peace and the Graduate Assembly for their generous sponsorship. Um, without them, this event would not have been possible. And now I'd like to introduce the panel. First, we'll hear from Joel Salatin, who is farmer and owner of Polyface Farm. Um, it's a sustainable farm that was made famous in uh, um, The Omnivore's Dilemma, which is Michael Pollan's book, I'm sure most of you have read it, and also the film Food Inc. and the newer film Fresh. Sibella Kraus is founder and president of SAGE, the Sustainable Agriculture Education Foundation, and she's also the founder of the um, Ferry Plaza Farmers Market in San Francisco. And then we have Ignacio Chapella, who is our very own professor here of microbial ecology. Um, he is internationally renowned as a researcher and perhaps most widely noted for his work in Mexico showing the connection between or the effect of genetically modified corn on ancestral varieties. Um, he also somehow makes the time to talk to wide-eyed undergraduate students like me. And he is also the faculty sponsor for the decal that the Food Collective is teaching this semester. I encourage you to check that out. Um, thank you all for joining us, the panel. All three speakers are experts on the areas of food, agriculture, and ecology. And they will draw from their unique experiences and um, backgrounds to offer us an interesting dialogue on the question is sustainable food and agriculture the future? And before we begin, two quick announcements. Please turn off all of your cell phones. And um, you <coughs> should have a note card that was provided to you. Those are for questions. Please write your questions on that note card. We'll have volunteers coming around with baskets um, towards the end of the dialogue. Um, and I will read your questions to the panel in the last 20 minutes. So without further ado, uh, Joel Salatin. Can everybody hear me all right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, my theater voice and will be heard. <clears throat> I'm going to use as a template uh, a list of kind of criticisms of sustainable agriculture that the, whoever the gahuntas are here that organized this thing sent to me because uh, I figured we might as well meet these criticisms uh, head on. The first one is that um, get my watch off so I can. Oh, there is a clock back there. Is that clock correct? No, no it's not correct. It's only correct twice a day. Ah, <laughs> oh, that clock is correct. Okay, very good. Um, the first one is that um, our kind of farming, maybe I should just uh, start with this in case you don't know what kind of farming we do. We're in um, multi-speciated uh, pasture-based livestock. We raise salad bar, beef, piggerator, pork, pastured poultry, broilers, turkeys, and eggs, and uh, forage-based rabbits, forestry products, and anything else that we can put together to try to uh, pay the taxes. <laughs> um, and the, the first criticism, and this is very, very common, is this requires way too much land. You can't have all these animals out here on pasture. Uh, it would just take way too much land to do that kind of thing. All right. When you see pictures of concentrated animal feeding operations. Everybody knows what those are. Tyson Chicken House, Smithfield Hog Factory, uh, Harris Feedlot down here, um, um, confinement dairies. And you see these pictures of these uh, monuments to the stupidity of man uh, <laughs> sitting there and, and, and the industry says this is economies of scale. 
its efficiency. Look how much we're producing on such a little amount of land. What you're not seeing in that picture are the hundreds and hundreds of acres of grain production land necessary to feed the grain into those houses. The industry wants you to think that this is some great uh, uh, achievement of efficiency that we can cram all these things in one little spot, one little footprint, and 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 as if it's a standalone efficiency, if it's a, a standalone model. And it's absolutely not. It, it is a completely dependent model on cheap fuel to grow all the grain, cheap fuel to dry all the grain, cheap fuel to transport all the grain, and not only just all the acreage, but the cheap energy to make it happen, and then to dispose of all the manure, which is now, instead of being spread out in the fields, um, it is now concentrated in a, in, a, uh, in a toxic situation that's too much for the land surrounding that CAFO to even to handle, and so it gets trucked to far distances with more cheap fuel. So the, 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 the lie that the industry presents to us, that this is some sort of a, a standalone efficient kind of thing and it would take so much land to do what we do, is simply not true. If our animals didn't eat one blade of grass, if the, if, if the pasture didn't displace any of the grain they're eating, let, let's just assume that for a minute, okay? Let's assume that the chickens don't get 15% off the pasture, that the pigs don't get 50% off the pasture, that the cows don't get 100% off the pasture. Let's just assume that they don't get anything off the pasture. It would not take one more acre to grow them outside those CAFOs than it does inside. Does everybody follow me? And so this thing about it takes way too much land to, to uh, empty concentrated animal feeding operations is a totally spurious argument. It wouldn't take one more ounce of land to, to spread those animals out onto the land as it does to concentrate them and bring all the land produced feed to them. The same amount of land and the same amount of feedstuffs. Now, the fact that our animals do displace a lot of grain, the beef cows, of course, and, and I mean herbivores, can displace all the grain, means that the tilled acreage, the land that's in tillage, can be greatly reduced. And, and, and as soon as we begin greatly reducing the acreage that's in tillage, that's the acreage that erodes the worst and that um, requires the greatest amount of chemicals, the greatest amount of petroleum, the greatest amount of energy in order to till it, plant it, harvest it, whether it's no-till or, or, or minimum till or complete till, doesn't matter. Uh, it's going to, it, it, it reduces the amount of tillage required to grow those crops. But we go beyond that. Let me give you an example. We're running our pigs in forest. Now this is a historical, traditional thing that was done. George Washington ran pigs at Mount Vernon. Um, uh, you know, in the uh, Iberian Peninsula in Spain, you know, they run the black-footed pigs through the, under the uh, cork trees. And, uh, you know, imagine a culture, imagine a culture where the, the person who knows how to prune the cork trees for maximum acorn production is revered as much as a heart surgeon. Imagine that kind of culture. That's what we're talking about here. And so they have sculpted over centuries a landscape to produce cork for wine bottles and uh, acorns for fattening pigs and, and over centuries have selected a porcine genetic that works very well in that pasture uh, acorn forage system. So on our farm, we have several hundred acres of forest that, you know, in previous years um, were burned by the Native Americans routinely to keep down the underbrush and, and all that and, uh, and, and, and maintain the oak trees in a silvopastoral setting 
where the canopies are able to spread and reach physiological genetic expression because of the wider spacing between the trees. Well, once the fire departments came in and fire was suppressed and all the big uh, three million hurt head herd of buffalo were gone that used to maraud through and beat down the saplings and the brambles and that sort of thing and keep it park-like and open. Once all that was done, then these forests started to grow in densely and get very thick. In fact, now uh, the, the uh, silviculturalists are telling us that these Appalachian oak forests are dying due to a lack of periodic disturbance that's necessary to maintain that openness and keep the oak trees healthy. And as somebody who cuts a lot of oak trees, I can assure you that if 70% of our oak trees are dying inside, they all, they're all uh, decaying and dying. The problem is, how do you get disturbance? You know, the, the, it's illegal to, to uh, start fires anymore. And so we're now running the pigs in the forest using high-tech electric fencing with computer chip mi uh, uh, micro-energizers so that we can run a single strand of electric fence out through, you know, and just encircle three to five acres using uh, simple nylon rope as a poor boy insulator, no fence posts, no nothing, just zigzagging it from tree to tree off a of nylon rope, okay? And we can put 50 pigs in there, and the pigs then uh, eat the acorns, they till the pine needles and uh, leaf duff into the soil to stimulate decomposition, they eat the bugs, and the critters that would affect the root crowns of the oak trees, they eat those to protect the oak trees, and they eat the starchy roots from the mountain laurel and the brambles and the greenbrier uh, that would that, that choke and, and act as wheat species and open it up so that there's a second tier of forage production, weeds, forbs, grasses, legumes, under these trees to create a second biomass solar collector rather than just a sterile leaf duff under the trees. And so the pigs are converting what would normally be wasteland <coughs> and displacing it and using the, uh, the perennial production and the root starches in that what would normally be only a, a once a generation thousand dollar per acre harvest and instead displacing three to five hundred dollars worth of grain per acre from otherwise wasted <coughs> feedstuffs. This could be done on mesquite in Texas, it can be done in, in pinyon pine and in, in, in canyons of, of the west. Um, every, every place has its mast, its, its, um, you know, its nuts and, and edible things that big, pigs have a pretty wide uh, edibility, <laughs> palatability index. <laughs> the point is that we can take every pig currently grown in confinement animal feeding operations, spread them out in the forest lands of America, and produce all the pork we're producing without any of the tillage. What do you think about that? And the trees would be healthier. <laughs> and it would make pork that's fit to eat. You know, when the industry says pork the other white meat, they should say pork the other white, junk, nutritionless, slovenly, you know, <laughs> tasteless, atrophied, whatever. <laughs> Real pork should be rose-colored and vibrant and get a lot of gamboling exercise. So, so when we look at it that way, we begin to realize, indeed, this kind of farming does not take larger amounts of land. All right, the second one, it takes larger amounts of, how much time do I have? You have a good 20 minutes. 20 more minutes? All right. Uh, the second one is that it takes a large amount of labor. I am absolutely convinced, and I do a lot of traveling now, I am absolutely convinced that a lot of people, if they really thought they could make a white collar salary farming, would love to farm. But 
we all know that in our culture it's axiomatic that there ain't no money in farming. And only dummies do that. Redneck hillbilly trip over the transmission in the backyard hits. <laughs> <laughs> That's who farms. And so we grow up in our culture stereotyping the dregs of society as the stewards of our air, soil, and water. Now, I think it would be great if we had more farmers. In fact, I think it's actually a great uh, 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 you know, policy or, or societal question right now that this great experiment in our civilization, which, in, which has been the only civilization in the history of the world to incarcerate twice as many people in prisons as we have farmers, if such a civilization can even survive. Can we even survive when less than 1% of the population is involved in farming? It's a valid question. So I don't apologize that our system takes more labor on the farm. What I will disagree with is that this system takes more labor overall. Because if you took the labor that's currently involved in farm pollution mitigation, in mitigating soil loss, in mitigating the half million cases of foodborne bacterial diarrhea that the Centers for Disease Control tells us we get from pathogens in our food, including 5,000 dead people. If, if, if you take up all of the people involved in mitigating the externalized social and environmental costs to the food system, our system actually takes fewer people. Now, it puts more people on the land, okay? But what's wrong with that? I can think of a lot worse things to do than being stuck on a beautiful piece of landscape with <laughs> mountains and sunrises and dew-speckled morning uh, chores to do, you know, walking out. I mean, people pay big money for my view every day. <laughs> I never get tired of it. It's extremely therapeutic. In fact, I would suggest it's the beginning of common sense. Concrete and asphalt are the end of common sense. So, the fact that our system uh, puts more people on the land does not mean in aggregate that it takes more labor. In fact, I would say that it takes a lot less labor. Interestingly, not, uh, this, this did not ask the question about price. And is this really not a movement of elitism? Um, in the last 30 years, the per capita expenditure on food has dropped from 18% to 9%. The per capita expenditure on health care has gone from 9% to 18%. Is anybody asking if those two are related? You know, we said you get what you pay for in a lot of things. And I think that we need to be paying a little bit more for our food because that's the only way that we're going to have the best and brightest going to the land of the Jeffersonian intellectual agrarian. What's wrong with that? See? And, uh, when the next time you go to farmer's market and the farmer drives up in a new BMW, <laughs> pat yourself on the shoulder that you created a Jeffersonian intellectual agrarian. <laughs> we'll know we're getting somewhere on this when the next time you go to a soccer game and all the soccer moms are out strutting their stuff, you know, and talking about the little child progenies when one of them says to the others, without embarrassment, well, my little Johnny or Mary is going to grow up and be a farmer. And all the other women say, wow, stop, that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> the third argument is, according to this uh, paper, is that this kind of, our kind of farming is less productive. It's thought to be less productive than conventional agriculture. 
Boy, this is one of my favorite ones. Because the ancillary, the, the, the other part of this is that we really can't feed the world with this way. <laughs> oh, it's, it's, it's nice to talk about the pigness of the pig and the chickenness of the chicken and earthworms and fuzzies and all that. But at the end of the day, it really doesn't feed the world. And this is a very important point because if, this, if my system can't feed the world, then I might as well go home. Because ultimately, it's not acceptable to be promoting a system in which half the world has to die. Which is, of course, what the industrial food system, the, the Monsanto folks, want you to think. So, let's deal with this. Let me set a historical context. Let's go very quickly. It's 1910. John Steinbeck, Grapes of Wrath. Little House on the Prairie. The Oregon Trail is done. There is no more west. You know, until then, we could always find new lands heading west. By that time, there was no more. Dust bowls. We had the end of the virgin land, both in Australia and in the U.S. And we had the urbanization, the beginnings of the industrial economy and the urbanization of the civilization, the people moving to cities. And um, so there was a, a worldwide paranoia of how do we feed these people? It's a big deal. How do we feed these people? And so two schools of thought began trying to find the answer to that question. One school of thought looked at life and biology as a primarily mechanical process. And that was the school of thought sprung from the work of Justice von Liebig in Austria in 1837, who with his vacuum tubes showed the world that all life is just a rearrangement of M, P, and K. Very mechanical view. The other school of thought grew out of the, uh, the romantic life biological um, Eastern school of thought in which it's not just parts, it's wholes. And, 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 and biology, life, is different than mechanics. You know, if you, if you drive down the road and your front uh, right wheel bearing starts going thump, thump, thump in your car, you can't just park the car on the side of the road and walk away for five years and come back and get back in it and have it all healed up. That's the difference between mechanics and life. And so this school of thought, which of course you know included Emerson and Thoreau and, and um, Audubon and John Murr and Aldo Leopold, that, that viewed uh, life as far more, um, uh, biology as far more uh, mysterious and uh, required reverence and respect. They started doing their research. And that school of thought was led by a man named Sir Albert Howard, who in 1943 brought his life's gift to the world, where he'd spent his life in the experiment station in Indore, India, uh, uh, finding the scientific aerobic, the formula for scientific aerobic composting, carbon, nitrogen, air, water, and microbes, and the right formula and mixture of those uh, substances. If you go to any living history farm <coughs> in the Western world that's that's you know has costumed interpreters and stuff, and you go to one of these farms and it's set before 1950, there's one thing you will not see at any of them. That's a compost pot. Because it was simply not done in the West. And so Sir Albert Howard defined this and brought it to us with his agricultural testament in 1943. But there was something else going in 1943 that kind of distracted the world from that discovery. Yeah, it's called WWII, <laughs> right? This kind of conflagration. And interestingly, to win the war took a rearrangement of N, P, and K, because interestingly, that's what you make bombs out of. And so there was a, all the, the creative and innovative effort that had been devoted to how do we feed the world was diverted to how do we make bombs and the manufacture, distribution, policy, and chemicals surrounding bomb making trumped any other discovery that could be made at the time. World War II is now over. It's 1947 and you're a farmer and you need soil fertility. You have two options. 
You can either go down and buy this little stuff in a bag and spread it, or you can use scientific aerobic composting, which is all about biomass, degeneration, decomposition, feeding the soil, food web, the life that's in the soil, which happens to be more than the life that's on the, that we can see, feeding that to, uh, to create the fertility. The problem is that in 1945, as a farmer, you don't have the infrastructure to metabolize the innovation that Sir Albert Howard brought. In innovation, all innovation has a tip and then there's a, there's a slinky effect, a lag time, until all the, the, the metabolism of infrastructure, policy, and understanding uh, uh, develops to metabolize that point of innovation. Right now we see it in our culture with e-commerce. With e-commerce e is booming way up here, being very innovative, and state and national and local governments are going into apoplectic seizures trying to figure out how to collect the sales tax on it when nobody goes to a cash register. That's a perfect example of where the innovation is running ahead of the, of the cultural uh, metabolic capacity and the infrastructure to, to handle the point of innovation. Well, this was the same way. His composting method required copious amounts of shredded biomass. In a day before farmers had PTO-powered tractors or even tractors, I mean, we were still using, in, in my neck of the woods, in uh, Virginia, we were still using mules and horses in you know the early 1950s. Farmers, a lot of them didn't even have tractors. They were still using draft power, um, uh, electricity. We needed um, ability to move it cheap, uh, inexpensively. Um, you couldn't, you just couldn't move this stuff with a, with with by hand with a fork. Uh, you couldn't move the volume of it that you needed to move. There was a reason why his work was done in <laughs> India, where labor was cheap. And you could, you could chop this stuff up with a machete and, and, and move it by hand. And there's a reason why that it, it happened there in India even that early. There was already a, a labor differential. And so um, this, this gift to the world cannot be metabolized because we didn't have hydraulic front end loaders, tractors, ease of movement, ease of chipping and shredding and spreading and handling the biomass on site uh, created by solar energy on site that, 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 that was necessary to do large-scale composting. So in 1947, you're a farmer, what are you going to choose? Are you going to choose the simple little cheap bag of NPK fertilizer that the Pentagon paid for all the manufacturing and metabolism policy and distribution system and, 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 and you got it cheap? Or are you going to go over here and use this one, you've got to use a machete and chop it up and fork it and spread it and spend all your time and all the people in the community trying to spread this stuff around? Which one are you going to choose? The bag, of course, of course the bag. And, and it took 30 years for our side to get the infrastructure necessary to metabolize this new aerobic composting model. It's as if in 1947, a starting gun went off for a race and, and our side, start on the starting line, and the other side had a two-lap head start because the Pentagon paid for all the me metabolism necessary to assimilate the knowledge for NPK mechanical understanding. Are you following me? This is important because, because it's easy for us to demonize those farmers that started with this. But the problem was they didn't even have the, the, the infrastructure to metabolize the knowledge of the point of the innovation. Here's my point, folks. If we had had a Manhattan project for compost, okay, not only would we have fed the world, we would have done it without making three-legged salamanders, infertile frogs, and a dead zone the size of, of Rhode Island in the Gulf of Mexico before the oil spill. Okay? <laughs> So we have to keep this in, in context. And now today, wow, today we've got little hydraulic <laughs> tractors that can run on vegetable uh, diesel oil with hydraulics and little front end loaders or four wheel drives. We've got chipper shredders that can very, very efficiently uh, <laughs> uh, uh, convert, you know, thready, big junky biomass into little chips that can then be composted. I mean, we've got, goodness, we've even got uh, uh, electromagnetized uh, 
foliar emulsion sprays uh, beamed out with, with electromagnetic energy with loudspeakers beaming calypso music to open the stomata real wide and take in all this foliar fish emulsion. <laughs> so our side has come a long way. Okay. Now we're spinning circles around the other side. They just but but the other side just doesn't know it yet because they've got a lot of inertia and a lot of policy and a lot of subsidies and a lot of sweetheart deals and a lot of okay to defend them and to and to, to do that. But absolutely, our side has has come on to this point. Um, so we are absolutely more productive. I won't belabor that because I've got to finish with the last one. It's the same product in the end. Final. It's the same product in the end. What's the difference between sustainably grown organic local vegetables and its conventionally grown counterpart? Well, the difference is one is edible and one isn't. <laughs> it's a very simple difference. But let's take, let's take a couple of examples. Uh, one is conjugated linoleic acid. And you've heard of it as CLA. You know, Americans, we can't, we can't talk in multisyllabic words, so we you know, <laughs> press everything down into, you know, so CLA. Um, all right, so this CLA, we really haven't known about CLA very long. It was only discovered about 20 or 30 years ago. And um, it, is a, uh, it is a double helix, it, it's, it's a molecule that has bins in it. It has two bins in it, like a packing peanut. And it creates a lot of the elasticity in the synapses. And it's also the number one anti-carcinogen that we know. <laughs> It's especially prominent in seafood, uh, seaweed, kelp, uh, fish emulsion, cod liver oil, that sort of thing. But now we know it's also very prevalent in herbivores who don't eat any grain, and it only takes 14 days of grain feeding to chase it all out of the body. Now, it really bothered American scientists and epidemiologists quite, uh, for a while because they couldn't figure out why in Argentina, where the per capita consumption of red meat is double what it is in the U.S., they had half the colon cancer rate. I thought red meat created colon cancer. Well, the reason is because the Argentinian meat was all grass-finished and had high amounts of conjugated linoleic acid in it, which is the number one anti-carcinogen. All right? That's a kind of big difference, don't you think? And then you go to polyunsaturated, saturated, unsaturated fats. We all know that there are good fats and bad fats and on different fat profiles, those sorts of things. When we go to a pasture-based system with a lot of exercise and sunshine and grass-based, salad bar-based, the, the, the fatty acid profiles completely change and the polyunsaturates go way up through the roof and there are fewer of the saturated fats. In fact, on our chickens, if you take the chicken broth, put it in the refrigerator, the, uh, we got this from a local dietitian. She was a local dietitian at the hospital. She used her, her, uh, her, her kitchen there, her lab at the hospital, to run a bunch of tests on, on our meats. And she began prescribing them for heart patients because what she found was that we had these high polyunsaturated and no saturated. So the fat profile completely changes. Um, Mother Earth News magazine commissioned a study, you can Google this, uh, over two years now, they've done this in their magazine comparing pastured eggs to the regular uh, U.S. duh um, um, label for eggs. And, um, and they, they, they take about uh, 11 nutrients, you know, riboflavin, folic acid, um, cholesterol, different things in the egg. And uh, about 12 of us around the country submitted our eggs to a lab. I don't remember. I think it was. I don't remember where it was. Uh, but anyway, we went to the same lab, and um, and Mother of the News magazine has covered this. And I mean, the profile is so different, you wouldn't even think it's the same substance. It's that far different. Okay. Anecdotally, you'll appreciate this. We have a, a <coughs> caterer that does wedding cakes. They sell wedding cakes by uh, by by vertical inch. So much an inch. How many inches you want? And um, what they found is that if they use our eggs with the same recipe, they get 30% more elevation because there's that much structure in the egg to whip up better. <laughs> pastry chefs. The pastry chef window for freshness and marketability is 36 hours. With our eggs, they can get 72 hours. That's the difference between profit and loss in a pastry deal. 
Okay? We have numerous high cholesterol patients that start eating six eggs a day in their 80s. And in three weeks, their cholesterol is normal every single time. This has been done over and over and over again. Folks, we really are what we eat. And it does make a huge difference how these animals were raised and what we do with them. We can, we can check them empirically. We can check them anecdotally. We can even feel it in our bodies. So uh, there is a huge difference on the product in the end. And I would suggest that staying healthy um, gives a better quality of life than getting sick and then going to the hospital and hoping that somebody there can fix whatever you did by shortcutting nature's template. So we can not only feed the world, we can do it in a way that builds the soil and that creates healthy people and healthy local economies. It's all a win-win situation. The only people that lose in this kind of situation are the Monsantos, but who cares about that? <laughs> Like this 
window here very quickly just to frame the dimensions that we're talking about because you were talking about our campuses, you went, were going through history. And I just want to remind ourselves about where we are. Um, right now behind that tree that I cannot see is where the NPK world started after Germany it actually was brought here. And this is where the malnutrition world started. I work in that building. Um, to the point where not many years ago our dean in the College of Natural Resources was going out to the Central Valley to preach to the farmers about the day when we were looking forward and working for the day when we were going to be growing everything without soil. Because we know so much about NP and K. Right next door we have the place where transgenics started, where the first environmental release of transgenic GMO organisms happened. A little bit further up, we see the place where the economics and the economic thinking has been put out to push aside as externalities all the things that you pointed out that should have been brought into the equation. Over here, we have the place where sociologists are hard at work at convincing nations around the world that this is a great idea, that we should keep those externalities to the places, as some people say, that are underpolluted in the world. Right? There's a famous uh, Summers quote where they say that some African countries are underpolluted and should take a little bit more pollution. <laughs> um, just a, a bit further up, we have the place where the laws are pr produced that have gone to the extreme of even, and I'm not exaggerating, calling people who are looking for these solutions enemy combatants. And many colleagues who have been out there trying to do this are actually have actually found themselves in the crosshairs of the FBI and people like that. You move a little bit further up and you go to the BP Berkeley building where genetically modified organisms are being produced to produce biofuels. Another, you know, steroid kind of idea for what you were just criticizing. And then, of course, you continue off, and you go to where the Manhattan Project actually came out of, and where we, I feel, should be doing exactly what you're saying. So, you guys, I think, represent, and I think uh, you should know that you're talking to the best and the brightest of that alternative. <laughs> 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 Of, uh, of reality. Very well aware of that. Yes, <laughs> very well. Aware. Um, I just wanted to make one last one last comment about um, about the fact that you have to start representations in, on a defensive note. I'm very aware that there are all these all these criticisms that are brought up. Uh, the elitism criticism, the criticism that this cannot be expanded, and so on and so forth. And not to make a lecture about it, but I think I am convinced that what's happening here is the usual practice of shooting the messenger and pointing the finger at the messenger instead of at the real problem and the people who are actually causing that problem. I, um, I'm sure you don't have all the answers. It's amazing how many answers you actually do have. <laughs> <laughs> it's really extraordinary. Um, but, I, but who would expect this one person to have all the answers. But the answers that you do have seem to me really, really real because you are diversity literate, you are socially aware, you're politically aware, and that I think is the foundation that would create a sustainable world in the future, not one where there is just one single answer that will solve all the problems, but one where every place, every landscape, as you talk about, is actually adapted and adopted to, pr to produce whatever is best, including non-agricultural products. And that's one thing that I would like to raise, that we are so obsessed about producing food and feeding the world that we always forget that there are other parts of the world that, don't, that shouldn't be producing food, that shouldn't be uh, thought in terms of productive capacity. So, those are the comments that I wanted to see your response to and how you feel to be in this campus. Oh, well, it's, well nobody's thrown a tomato at me yet, but I haven't gone have to those buildings. But not last season. No, 
I, 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 I'm, I'm uh, uh, very honored to, to be here, and I appreciate absolutely. You know, I understand the uh, the uh, social, the the, well, the cultural um, um, innovation that has happened right here, for good or bad, right. in, in any case. So yeah, this is uh, this is this is neat ground. Um, there isn't one answer. By any means, but there's a there's a combination of things. Let me just throw out maybe a couple of things that you just might think about. One is this is just this is just stuff to all right out of the box. If every kitchen in America had enough chickens, just say this carefully, kitchen and chickens. <laughs> if every kitchen in America had enough chickens attached to it to eat the food scraps from that kitchen there would not even be an egg CAFO or egg commerce in the entire country. But what happens is we get little green environmental awards when, for example, an institutional dining services um, separates out its compostable uh, trash and puts it in a diesel truck and goes 10 miles away somewhere to a composting facility and ooh, ah, we gaga over that as if that's really green when the really green thing would be to just hook the chicken house right up to the kitchen and have the eggs go into the kitchen and the scraps go into the chickens and it all just happens with no diesel fuel whatsoever. <laughs> if, all of the, uh, if all of the diesel fuel that's been spent to send California unseasonal produce to the East Coast had gone into making plastic film for season extension hoop houses and greenhouses on the East Coast, there would not be any unseasonal vegetables having to go from California to there, and then California could become more food sufficient and there would be more areas for wildness. These are they're just two things. Um, but I, I think that they, they speak to the kind of um, interrelatedness and the, the close relationship that we need to see when we start talking about these issues and not come to it with such a compartmentalized view, um, which these buildings tend to represent. You know, the uh, you know we've got a, we've got we've got a we've got a problem here we solve we've got a problem here we solve then over here we solve the problems that the problem solved over there created. <laughs> And, uh, and, but but if, if we could become eclectic and broadly diversified in our thinking so that we bring our disciplines together multi, in a multidisciplinary way, um, then we start, we start really getting to the, you know, to the crux of the issues. Um, I had the pleasure this morning of also hearing Joel speak at Kaiser, where he walks right into the lion's den and says, you know, you know, you guys are, have all these very high rates and food has gone down and, you know, as he said again this morning, we really need to reverse this. But you said something there that really struck me. You talk about neighborhood friendly farms or neighborhood friendly farming. And I wanted to follow up on that for a moment because I had for a while an affiliation with the College of Environmental Design, which you, which you skipped over in your tour. And I, I mean, but there's obviously there's lots going on here. Um, because I think this is a key part of the use too. We, we tend to think of urban is here, agriculture there is, wilderness is some, someplace else. And I think the smart people are saying, you know, the, um, what looks like wilderness in fact as often as the Native Americans had a lot of significant cultivation and, and so on. And there are people who forage, get all that food foraging in, in the heart of San Francisco. So how do those systems intertwine? And um, I heard a pretty, pretty succinct statement of this the other day, so saying as we address um, our the, the sustainability of the human population, and look at the sustainability of the of the environment. Those two things and those two efforts are clearly very, very interlinked. So, um, and it's sort of an area that we work on. So, I am interested in on you know on the farm scale, one can understand it, but at a regional scale or metro regional scale around DC or around the Bay Area, how can we look at farming becoming more friendly on a 
No, again, in the sort of scale of the city state or metro region, which is the way a lot of planners and sustainability folks are starting to talk. Thank you. That's a great question. Uh, I'll just start it with this little interesting statistic. America has 35 million acres of lawn. <laughs> wow. We have yummy, 30, yummy. Yeah, we have 35 million acres of lawn. And we have 36 million acres devoted to feeding and housing recreational horses. You take that 35 million plus 36 million, 71 million acres and according to John Jevons, the uh, you know the, um, the double dug bed French intensive biointensive gardening guru, that would be enough to produce all the food for all Americans without any farms. I think I mean, that's, that, that, that's, that's, <laughs> that's that's astounding. You know that's astounding. And, and when you realize that in 1946, 50 percent of all produce in America was grown in backyard gardens. You know, it, it, there, there's a lot of the suburbs, the suburbs, all these, you know, five acre, six acre residential estates that, we, you know, we spread fertilizer on and run over with our little, you know, uh, John Deere jockeys. Um, there's a lot, there's a lot of land here. I was, um, I was in St. Louis recently and visited a one twelfth acre farm in St. Louis that was a, a crack house that the city had bulldozed. And these five young people had taken it over, built raised beds. They were taking all the kitchen scraps from the community, fitting it into uh, a vermicomposting bed and a chicken shelter there. And um, make a long story short, they were they were providing all the food except for meat and dairy for 20 families off this 12th acre farm. And I asked them, I said, so how much food in St. Louis could be produced? They was they said every bit of it. Baltimore has 40,000 acres of vacant lots. I think that gets at the question, what does it mean to be a farmer? Are you 100% farmer or 100% urban? Now, I think as we look at this urban-rural linkage, we're really looking at occupations. There are people who, um, I mean, we sort of don't think, well, if, if the one spouse is a school teacher, the other one is. We, and we tend to think, well, farming is different. You know, if there's somebody earning a secondary living on a farm, well, that's something wrong with that farm operation, which is kind of ridiculous. But, you know, what, what I sort of see is that everybody being a bit of a farmer, whether it's, you know, again, enjoying the backyard or growing in the neighborhood a lot, that there's that knowledge of simply how to grow a carrot or a head of lettuce. That doesn't mean that that's a full-time occupation. But I think by the same token, there's this great prejudice, which I think you may have mentioned earlier, the people who live in the country are hicks. And I think I think that there's... Well, most of us are. <laughs> <laughs> but then you call, yourself, you call yourself a Jeffersonian intellectual. And so I don't think that's the picture. Because, but I think really there are some real issues here. So, so one of the ways that I see it, what we need to revitalize is not just the way we're farming, but very often we really need to revitalize rural communities. And, and I was involved in a project here recently where... And, and we... we and uh, I'll just mention briefly that this was a town that was looking to get a bit more density because it was going to have some uh, centers, it was going to have a rail system come through it. And I was really excited to see as this town sort of contemplated a bit more density and a bit more urbanity, it made it a more exciting town. And by that very same token, it, it, there was a sense that its edges would now become more important. And so I think that, and there are also many examples where some of the problems or the, the economic problems in agriculture are not solved only at the farm scale, they're solved at the rural community scale. That rural community needs housing, for example, for people working on the agriculture, or they need a processing facility that's centralized. So I think we really, when we look at how to solve these problems, um, we need to look at the urban problems and some of the rural problems that's being interlinked. And we have a perfect example here in the Bay Area where um, the Bay Area metropolitan you know, ABAG and the, so the uh, as a six, nine county area, we are charged now through SB 375 to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. And all these councils looking at this are focusing on the built environment, they're focusing on transportation and density, but they're really not looking at agriculture and as part of it at all yet. So green really means what can we do green for the built environment? Can we make this building more efficient? Can we have more people on transit? But, but I think it's time to really look at the agriculture in that old garden city sense from 100 years ago. You, 
you like yes. to go back to the John Howard times, well, that was part of what he inherited, too. Yes. Yeah. I'm interested. I'm actually excited. You you have such a <laughs> no. I, I I agree. I, I mean, I, I think I think uh, for example, you know, we we hear a lot about food deserts, for example, in, in poverty inner cities, and um, and the problem is that we don't have we don't the, the, the building the building inspection and food police are not sitting down trying to figure out how to how to incorporate food production in the food desert. They're trying to figure out how to get food from out there in here when actually there's all these vacant lots in there that can be turned into food and people can take the kitchens they already have and start cottage entrepreneurial industries making pot pies and broth and chicken stock out of their own gardens and backyard rabbits and chickens for their neighbors in the community. But it's not sown that way. No, or beef. there isn't a strong yeah. enough beam for a commercial kitchen to be under or right. you know, all these a big deal just happened in San Francisco, many of you may have noticed, that there was, there's a long been an ordinance that you cannot grow food in your backyard for sale. As I understand it, there's still, it, throughout the Bay Area, you cannot grow food for sale. If you grow in your backyard, you cannot sell that food. You can't be a business person uh, okay. in your backyard. Yeah, because it's residential. Right, but, um, and that's sort of ridiculous, because if I've got extra, maybe I want to clean, but maybe I want to sell, right? But anyway, that's beginning to change. It's changed recently in San Francisco, and I think, there's discussions here in Berkeley that that should also change. That if you have um, you know thousand square feet in your backyard, it could be productive. You can put a greenhouse on it. Mm -hmm. That could be a small enterprise. Absolutely. Yeah. Often, often the, the so-called economic crisis, which is not a crisis at all, it's, it's, it's a development. Right? Often that situation is uh, is quoted as an argument for why your proposal couldn't possibly work, couldn't possibly be expanded, because we are in economic crisis times and we have to be economically efficient. But I, I look at it in a very different light, I think, which is a very hopeful one, the fact that these two big policy lavish words, which to me are the most important problems here, um, will cease to be the rulers. And those two policy lavish words are commodification and financialization. They're big ugly words, commodification, the idea that everything has to be translatable in a unit, a currency of energy of so much fat or whatever across the board and therefore can be exchanged. And then what's happening today is that it's a huge crisis of financialization where people are playing with real things as if they were toys, as if they were monopoly pieces and, and doing bets and so on with them. It's, there's still some time to uh, to move in these developments that's going to cause a lot of pain and a lot of hurt, especially when land and commodities are financialized more and more. But I find it really interesting that it is breaking down. And at some point, it won't make any sense anymore. And then people will have to start growing their food locally. And they will have to start dealing with each other, bartering, trading, or things like that. One of the sort of scary developments in that is that this trend towards investors buying up farmland along with gold, which is a bit scary in some ways, that you sort of feel like you're, you're seeing some start of a resource level. It's hugely scary. It's scary. Do, do you know, in California, we, we recently did a food set assessment that, according to set of, um, these sort of national food data sets, that in, in, in California, we an average, or in the whole West, an average of 70 pounds of pork per person per year. That's of the West of the United States. But in California, we raise maybe a quarter of a pound of pork per person per year. So how is that shift going to begin to take place? Probably eating a bit less pork is maybe part of it. Um, but how can that begin to shift over? Because it's crazy that the pigs are raised where the corn is, right? Well, I just, Not under the oak trees or the <coughs> Well, absolutely. Trees. I, mean, I, just, I just spent uh, a day, two days ago, with um, David Evans at Marin Sun Farms, um, that many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with right here in Point Reyes. And uh, we drove through miles of, um, of forest that would be greatly enhanced with, uh, when I say run the pigs in the forest, I'm not talking about we just turn them loose and they run in the forest. I'm talking about- feral pigs here already. Yeah, okay, well, I'm talking about running them, uh, you know, uh, 50 pigs on five acres, uh, two weeks in a whole year. 
uh, using this high-tech electric fencing infrastructure, which is very cheap, and you can't even see it. I mean, it's just a little fence that the pigs can see, and you can see if you're right there looking at it, but otherwise, the wildlife, the rabbits, I mean, it doesn't impede any kind of, it's just a single little wire. And, and um, you know, he's got this huge demand for pork in the area, um, and is surrounded by all these uh, forests that could actually use the disturbance once a year um, to mimic some of this gentle fire that used to go under that the Indian, that the Native Americans would start. Um, but of course, you know, he's precluded from doing that because of all sorts of you know regulatory, environmental, uh, different things. And so, um, and so, there there is lots of land to use, but we we essentially have come. Uh, in our culture to the point where we think the best thing we can do to the land is extract humanity. And what we're here for is not to, not to um, uh, arrogantly and manipulatively just rape and, just, and pillage, but rather to use our innovation and creativity and massage the landscape with managed disturbance to bring to bring it to greater solar biomass production in in, in real time with with regenerative principles, not oil, but in real time, than it would if left just to its static products. Because tillage, nobody has figured out how to make tillage a sustainable system. It all and, and so all historic systems. Uh, whether it was maize in Mexico, and you can certainly speak to this a lot better than I, but, but all these historic systems required a two to three year um, pasturage time between the tillage time for the soil to develop enough to then, to then uh, birth a, a, a tillage, you know, an annual crop. And that was held in balance inherently by using draft power, because draft power, whether it's a yak, a water buffalo, a horse, or a mule, needs pasturage. So that enforced a kind of uh, a, a, a perennial pasturage balance into the tillage equation. Now that we don't need draft power and that pasturage, well we can till all the time and, um, and, and just supplement with you know NPK, but like I said, that, that doesn't, that's not a regenerative system. It doesn't last over time. So as soon as we go to a perennially based system, Quit feeding herbivores grain in the first place, and then let the pigs go to perennials, and and, and chickens drop down to historic uh, levels of production, which basically there weren't any more chickens that could eat um, uh, homestead scraps. Chickens were scavengers, that's why only only royalty ate poultry. Uh, historically, chickens of all uh, poultry has always been the meat of kings, because grain was too expensive to feed to omnivores. If you have to, if you have to hand till, hand plant, hand hoe, hand scythe, hand shock, hand flail, uh, hand uh, be, uh, yeah, flail, hand winnow, and then gather up grain on a floor and put it in a mouse-proof vessel before uh, netting and before extruded uh, corrugated metal bins, where all you had that was vermin-proof was clay pots. I mean, Hosea in the Bible talks about uh, harlots being priced by the bushel of barley. I don't think it's because the harlots were cheap. <laughs> because the barley was expensive. <laughs> and, and, and so historically, grain has been very expensive because of all the handwork. Now with mechanization and, and, and uh, oil-based fertility, we're, we're able to... Um, short circuit, if you will, some of those inherent biological balances that at least kept us from destroying so much so fast. Mm -hmm. Now we can destroy a lot more quicker. <laughs> so I bet many of you have questions. Is there a system for collecting? Yeah, so uh, we've decided not to do the card, so if you'd like, just stand up and ask your question. And, um, I guess you guys can follow on to where we'd like. Okay. Uh, so you mentioned the ability to produce the same amount of pork sustainably, but seeing how people are dying of obesity and heart disease, do we really need that much pork? Do we need that much? Like that's my question. And, and there's also animals involved in this. Like what you do is 
for animals, so don't we need to eat less of that? Okay, uh, great question. Um, are you a vegetarian? Yeah. You're vegan. <laughs> <laughs> let, 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 let me let me let me go ahead let me go ahead and uh, and just go right in where angels fear to tread. <laughs> <laughs> Everything is eating and being eaten. If you don't believe it, go lie naked in your flower bed for three days and see what gets eaten. <laughs> and, and, you know, I'm, I'm being, I'm trying to be very respectful, but, but, but we have to understand that that this notion that you know a cat is a child, is a parent, is a fly, is a frog, is a baby, does not show some new evolved spiritual understanding that moves toward nirvana, it shows an unprecedented disconnect with our ecological umbilical. <laughs> I, I, I want to comment on that because I, I agree with what you just said on the one hand. On the other hand, that doesn't mean, I don't think you need to go all the way to, to veganism right. to recognize that there's just way too much of this stuff, and that people just assume way too much of, you know, cows waiting to be slaughtered at, 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 at you know, snap and command, and being delivered just to one part of the cow or one part of the chicken at very low price, and all these things that are assumptions that I think you are raising. And I think, and I think uh, uh, framing it as a either vegan or what we have, really raises the possibility of thinking of all the intermediate possibilities in between. I, I couldn't agree more. And, and trust me, I am no friend of CAFOs. I hope nobody thinks that I'm a friend. And I'm not a friend of, of any of the industrial farming practices that I see. But it's important to realize that 500 years ago, there were three times this, this United States area was carrying three times as many herbivores as it carries today, even with all of our tillage, silage, and NPK fertilization. Okay? So, it's not the herbivore that's the problem. It is the management of the herbivore that's the problem. And nobody could disagree more with industrial management of herbivores than I do. But if we go back to a, to a biomimicry situation like we see in the Serengeti, like we see in the Cape Buffalo, like we saw with the American, with the bison. Um, we see this principle, the herbivore is always moving, it's always mobbed up for predator protection, and it's mowing. The herbivore is the restart button to start the fast biomass accumulation of grass. In nature, grass, which will grow up to, well, shoot, in the, you know, in the Midwest, it was 12 feet tall. You can still see it if you go to Lincoln, Nebraska. Um, this uh, grass handled the way it was handled with two-legged and four-legged predators and bison and perennials sequesters way more carbon than forest. The reason that that's so hard for us to understand in our current culture is most of us, our only interaction with grass is the lawn. And we can't, and we look over here at the trees and we like, wow, look at all that biomass. If you come to our farm and you measure grass this tall and it does that two or three times a year, times 40 years, and you stack all that up, it's way more biomass than a tree. Now that doesn't mean I want to cut down all the trees. There's a balance here, okay? And all I'm, all I'm suggesting is that the, that the, if, if, if the grass, if the grass oxidizes, the carbon just goes off into the atmosphere. If the herbivore eats it before it oxidizes and restarts the, the, the sigmoid curve of biomass uh, uh, accumulation under photosynthesis, 
then it accumulates twice as much biomass, which can then be sequestered. That's why we call what we do mob stocking, herbivorous solar conversion, liquefied carbon sequestration, fertilization. <laughs> <laughs> so a great example of the carbon project in Durant. Exactly. The carbon project is exactly, yeah. And, and, and if every farm in America would do this that has herbivores, um, we would sequester all the carbon that's been emitted since the beginning of the industrial age in fewer than 10 years. You can't do it with tillage. You can't do it with corn-fed cows. So, uh, so actually, the the you know the the herbivore is the most efficacious environmental model to sequester the most carbon the fastest. If we want to talk about, it. So does it mean you need to eat them all? It does, no, absolutely, it doesn't any more than the buffalo or all. Absolutely not. No, it doesn't mean you need to eat them all, and it does mean you need, need mean you need to eat them all the time. It does mean that they are an integral, that, that uh, they are an integral component of the land healing cycle. It does mean that. And, 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 and that, we, that we could not, we could not heal the land, we could not sequester the carbon without it. You should say what you mean because nobody else is raising their hands. Oh, well, so. There. Oh, there are some. Okay. Uh, well, I just want to Can you talk sure. About there should be more herbivores. Like we can, we, herbivores like are good. Herbivores. There should be more of them. <laughs> sure. That's, that, the, the, my initial question was about the pigs and we're producing too much meat, and that question didn't really get answered. Because. Or would you want me to say that we're producing? Too, we should not produce as much meat as we're producing. Yeah, because you, you mentioned earlier. You said you know if and you gave a statistic about Americans again mm -hmm. the running of the pigs, and then you said. I would counter that, the, that, that all the, the trees, if you go to Virginia Tech and sit on, in a silviculture class, you will find, you will hear very quickly, the entire oak belt in Appalachia from, from Tennessee to Maine is all dying due to lack of disturbance. How do you suggest to deal with that? Why not let pigs run through? That's what I say. Absolutely. We agree. It's wonderful. Speak up so this doesn't become just a battle. <laughs> okay. Is there another question? Okay, please. Right there. Yes, you. I was wondering if you could talk a little more about kind of the, the question of labor. So I, I think you figured out a model where you can survive in today's economy and get a decent living. Um, I think a lot of organic agricultural farmers are, are struggling with that. And if you kind of envision, envision a, a future system where there are a lot more people returning to the land, um, how would, with more labor intensive um, farming practices, how do you envision that um, systems would evolve that would be competitive uh, with, you, you mentioned that people have are now paying a lot less of their budget than they're used to. Um, how are they going to, what is going to convince them that they should be paying more, and how would the, the labor costs in the U.S. be competitive <coughs> with, um, with other countries where labor costs are, are a lot less, so that would be to, you know, if people say, okay, I want organic, I'm going to import it where the labor costs are cheaper. Okay. I, I, can, I can do this. I can do this. It's a great question. Um, but first of all, I am not trying to impose my will on anybody. All right? I wish you would. <laughs> I'm not trying to impose my will on anybody. So I, I am not naive enough to think that tomorrow morning, suddenly everybody in America is going to wake up and say, oh, I would like to spend an extra 2% on my food. I'm not naive enough to think. And I don't even think we should have a national policy that says we should do that. Okay? I think it's one person coming to it one at a time, just like all of our customers have come to it one at a time. Our chefs have come to it one at a time. People come to this one at a time. Now, 
as far as the um, as far as the, the, the you know, do we have enough money? All right. Now in this room, I'm sure nobody here spends money on anything that's not necessary. <laughs> Let's talk about people outside. Can you think of anything people out there spend money on that they don't need to spend money on? Amen. Like Starbucks? Like $100 designer jeans with holes already in the knees? Like Coke? Like tobacco? Like widescreen TVs? Like ball games? You see what I'm saying? There's enough money in the system. All we have to do is reprioritize it a little bit and we're in business. It's not that much. You take the average shopping cart coming out of a supermarket, and if you took all the processed food out of there and bought the ingredients raw and used your newly gadgetized techno glitzy kitchen to make those products and get your nose out of the widescreen TV and People magazine, <laughs> you would have plenty of money for all of us to eat like kings. That's the one weakness, I think, in Food Inc., the movie, where they have the Hispanic family that can't afford the produce because they've just, and, and they just stopped at, at Burger King or whatever, you know, and they can't afford the produce because it's too expensive. Let me tell you something. A pound of our premium grass-finished ground beef is less than a Happy Meal. Which one do you think has more nutrition? Processed food's expensive. And you can go to the store and buy 69 cent premium Idaho baking potatoes, two, three, five aisles over, there's a whole aisle, you know, that's in a little, little section about, you know, three square feet. Over here, five aisles, there's a whole 120 feet of bags of those same potatoes in chips for $10 a pound. What are Americans buying? You can use your Cuisinart and get your local pork with the fat and make lard and cook your own potato chips in good pork lard and if they're thigh for <laughs> Another question. Yeah, back there in the back of the white shirt, Bill. Pick up the blue shirt. Yes. Okay, given the current societal conditions of How can we use those two things that are a lot of times negatively affecting sustainable agriculture to increase our mission and transform the U.S. food system? What are the two things? Risk management? Risk management and economic crisis. <laughs> well, our problem is that we don't have good systems in accounting to measure the things that are the most valuable. Has anybody ever gone in with a business plan to a banker, presented it, and the banker sits back, you know, in his big easy chair, and he says, wow, you know, smokes his cigar a little bit, he says, oh, this is a business plan, we're going to be a millionaire, you know. But I've got one question for you. What will this do to the earthworms in your community? <laughs> We laugh, but does anybody ask that? See, that's our problem. We don't have, in, 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 again, in our segregated, and you pointed out so well, in our segregated, um, um, you know, Greco-Roman, Western, segregated, systematized, fragmented, disconnected, linear reductionist systems, we don't have ways to measure three-legged salamanders and fertile frogs and happy families and, and um, you know, health. We don't, we don't have ways to measure it. So, I, that's not an answer. I would, you know, maybe one of you more no, I think it's smarter than answer. I am. It, it's a conundrum. It's honest accounting that would give the answer, but what happens is that GDP, all these problems are positive on the GDP accounting. The yes. way we account today, your lawsuit, your medical bill, your divorce, divorce, everything <laughs> goes as a positive to GDP. Yes, and therefore we support that kind of activity instead of saying we want less of that even if the GDP is lower. So I think honest accounting is the answer. Yeah, it's like Wendell Berry says, what's wrong with us creates more GDP than what's right with us. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good point. Sure, right there in the middle. Yes. Yeah. Everybody looks around. <laughs> oh, the handsome guy in the white shirt. All right, uh, so... Oh, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, so how do we, uh, given that there's interest in the room, uh, I feel like there's 
uh, especially in urban areas where we are, uh, there's a lack of knowledge or lack of transfer of knowledge. So how do we transfer the knowledge that for now is largely compartmentalized in rural areas mm -hmm. um, to the urban areas where you get these sort of urban rural areas? Or how do we get people doing this in urban areas? Well, I'll just say one quick, I have one of my <coughs> pet peeves these days, is people often want to know, well, where does my food come from? But they might want to know, they really don't want to know about the gut where. So if you really want to know where your food comes from, go to the where. Get to know Aromas and Lodi and Fabo and Molinas and Marshall and all these places that the food comes from. So I wouldn't get so hung up, as it 50, 25, 100, 150 miles? Because that really is pretty inorganic. That really doesn't mean very much. Really, if you look at the food shed of the San Francisco, Fresno is absolutely in our food shed. It's sort of part of our watershed. The, it, it's an efficient place to grow. It's an efficient place for us to get food, which is not to say that you know peaches grown in Redwood are great too. But but I think it's really to understand those places. And you know, it's to, whether it's talking to a farmer to farmers market or going. And I mean, there's so many experiences that one could have. And you know, what's interesting is I think when you go to have those experiences, you may well think, well, I am going to find out how this one innovative farmer is putting biochar made from his burned walnut shells into his field for carbon sequestration, and he's using the other um, energy produced to power his refrigeration, keep walnuts cold, which they have to be, to be done. So I mean, you might think, well, I'm going to go study this particular was a rather innovative system. But what you might find when you're out there is, oh, there are a lot of birds in this tree. There are a lot of birds here. You know, it really has to be experiential as well as intellectual. Because if it's just for just counting carbon and counting dollars, I mean, I think it has to be part of our basic being that there's something, and this is at least what is one of my inspirations, that these places are, um, have got some soulfulness or beauty or other parts of us that, that we experience. I mean, it's, to me, that peach in August is delicious, but the bare fruit, if you go out to a, a, an orchard in January, and it's, it, it's just gone through its winter chill, it's completely bare, and there's just a little bit of suggestion of those buds coming along, it's a very, it, it's a nurturing in a different kind of way, but nonetheless still nurturing as having that peach, and it'll make that peach taste all the better. Six months hence. Well said. <laughs> I just want to say, look around the room, build up networks. This relationship to food as an individual and, and, and the food up there is really important, but I think socializing that understanding that you have, and you're lucky to be sitting surrounded by a whole bunch of people who have you know, put their lives on the line really to, to, uh, to do this. It's not happening everywhere. So I think be proactive about your looking and look around the room. Yes. Um, you talk in your book um, about the problem of young people getting involved in agriculture and how like, the best and brightest all of the doctors. Um, but like it's still a matter of access to land and land ownership. And, um, how do you see the, I don't know, how do, you, how do you see young people getting involved with that? What's the, what's the point of entry for young people yeah. with, with, the, with land prices like they are? Because uh, that's another you know, blip in our abnormality right now is that the price of land bears no uh, relationship to its productive capacity. It's all based on developable or, or you know, viewscape or whatever capacity. Uh, very good question. Um, several things. One is that the farmer is aging in America. The average farmer now is almost 60 years old. So um, the ag econ people, at least Virginia Tech, and I think I can say this is probably pretty much nationwide, uh, say that in the next 15 years, almost 50% of America's farmland will change hands in the next 15 years. Now that's, that's either something we can all sit and you know get depressed about, or we can realize this is a time of unprecedented opportunity. I actually have letters on my desk from elderly farmers writing me, asking me, can you find me a young person to inherit my farm to? 
but they don't want to give it to their kids because other kids are just going to sell it. They love the land, they love the farm, they want it to continue in perpetuity, but you know, who's, going to, who's going to get this farm? Uh, there is a tremendous amount of land to rent, to lease. Uh, we just had an apprentice who finished with us, went back up to upstate New York where his family was. Within 30 days of going home, he had three landowners come to him and offer him a total of a thousand acres rent free just please come and do something um, we're now leasing six pieces of land two years ago we turned down three last year we turned down two we can't find enough people to go on to them so it's a really fluid time in that respect so um, I absolutely appreciate the desire to own land, at least own something. Absolutely, I appreciate that. But we absolutely also must not put land ownership as a prerequisite to start managing a piece of property. A farm basically is portable. I mean, when you think about a farm, the, the infrastructure, the machinery, the customers, you know, it doesn't matter whether you own it, rent it, have a 99 10-year ridge on it like Prince Charles has on all of his holdings, okay? Um, I have a friend doing a polyface China. He has a 1,000-acre farm in China where you can't own land, 1,000 acres for 99 years for 50 bucks a year, okay? I can do that. So, so, so you know, there, there, there is a lot of land available, and all I'll say then is, Bloom where you're planted. Do something where you are, and today's movement will create tomorrow's opportunity. We can't see down there 10 years, 15 years, but if there is a window box you can plant, if there's a, a, a little postage stamp yard that you can plant, if there's a, a triangle between two sidewalks that you can plant, plant it. See? Get rid of the parakeet and put two chickens in the cage. You know, eat your kids. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've heard about the innovations going on here that struck me as, I know groups of young people who've come together as six people. Right. And because they, none of them want to just like do nothing but. And, and so that's a model that kind of goes back, I think we used to call them communes, but maybe, maybe it's a slightly different idea now. But in other words, when you come together as a group, and somebody's good at this, and somebody's a good mechanic, and somebody's a good accountant, and somebody's a good soil scientist, and so on. So coming together in groups, I think, um, is one good way. One of the things that <clears throat> we're working on at Sage is the idea of these agricultural parks, where we capitalize them and put on the insurance and the infrastructure so they're farm ready, so you can walk on and start farming and take one and three and five year leases on them. So that model, I, I think, uh, is showing some good promise as well. Just a couple of ideas. I want to plug in um, somebody who was, like you, a uh, student here, and started actually several of the food movements in, on campus. Uh, some years ago, Severine from Charter Fleming. Uh, she has a group called the Greenhorns. Check them out online. Um, they're not the only one, but there are lots of people your age and a little bit older who are dealing with this, which seems to be a very important problem. Very, very big problem. Very big problem. Very big issue. Oh, and I have one more tiny little pitch, and that is next week is the Ecological Farming Conference. You will probably, does everyone know about the Eco Farm Conference? No? Well, I'm, I'm going to take, take you take a moment. So this is, I think it's now in its uh, 31st year, something like that, but it is one of the largest ecological farming conferences in the country, and it takes place in, in a Silmar, about two hours away, and I believe they're still um, trying to sell some tickets for one day, as you can't buy the whole conference and meals and lodging, but, and you can't sleep when you car on the grounds, but you know, there's a beach nearby and stuff. But, <laughs> but anyway, really take a look, Eco Farm Conference, and it is an extraordinary place to network, to get some ideas, attend some workshops, so, okay. Right there, yes. Sure, you. Last question. Last, last question. Oh, last question? Last question. Okay. Great question, and you are exactly right. Um, 
in my perfect world, we would eat very little poultry. The omnivore consumption would drop way, way down, and the herbivore consumption, which is on perennials, would go way, way up in my perfect world. So, you know, uh, actually everybody else calls us a sustainable farm. I don't call us a sustainable farm because at the end of the day, um, I really don't think we should be raising the number of broilers that we raise uh, for, that, for that very, very uh, reason. Uh, but, it, but it's a conundrum, you know, our customers want it. We've got neighbors that are growing GMO free and doing a really good job. Uh, I did visit, I'll just uh, share this with you, I, I was in Australia for three weeks just uh, last month, and I went to a farm, uh, Mr. Cease, who has 2,000 farmers now doing a no-till, using, using cattle and sheep as a, as, a, uh, as a prep tool to knock down forage, plant grains without any herb, herbicides or pesticides, into this forage, he comes back in and grazes it again to weaken it just a little, to give the grains time to germinate and sprout. I was in a 300 acre oak field. The production per acre is exactly the same in clean tillage, but it took zero fertilizer, no herbicides, no hoeing, and the forage was, was shaded and held back until the oaks turned brown, you know, and, and, got, and got finished, then the forage really jumped, they combined off the oats and had a nice 14 inch thick forage sod underneath it. There are 2,000 farms duplicating that, they can do it once every five years, so there is a way, and, and it actually makes the pasture grow better, because the disturbance slits, that where they plant the grain, the, the little, you know, one and a half inch wide slits, those disturbance slits are all filling up with little mycelia and creating more edge effect for the, for the perennial. So there's, there's a win-win there's a synergistic effect here. And the fact is, we can do that, but we, but you know, it, there, there's a valid question as to whether we could raise as much poultry as we do uh, if we just did it a once every five years. Are you with me? So the, 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 the centerpiece has to be the herbivore, and then the omnivore slides into a more historic scavenger or, or, or smaller role historically. That's the way I see a regenerative system. I don't even think we're there, okay? But, uh, but I admit it, I understand, you know, it's where we are. Thank you for the question. Okay, with that, we're going to have to wrap up because our event uh, staff are going to us out soon. But thank you all for coming. I'd like to mention that please do continue the conversation. Um, join the Food Collective, um, join the DECAL, but just organize and maybe we can answer this question. Is sustainable agriculture a future? Thank you for coming.